So, um, just so you know, so we have basically we have the we have derm to cover, and then we have oncology, and so we have three more class sessions to go. So I should be able to cover everything, and then uh, the last session will be a review. I don't know if I'll have any slides to wrap up necessarily, but the last section will be just review, uh, and we should be good to go. Any questions on anything? It's been a while since we've met last. It feels like a month or so. It's like no. All right, so we're gonna get into the dermatology. Have you started this in CMS yet? Good. So have you finished it yet? You just started. Okay. All right, not even close. That's good. So we are going to get into it and see. You know, um, this isn't like the longest section, as you'll see, like, you know, derm can be pretty comprehensive. Um, but again, there's not like a huge number of drugs um, they're going to be using for as opposed to, you know, other disease states like hypertension or hyperlipidemia. So um, this will be a relatively short section. Just know that, um, you know, once you get down into further depth into something like if you really want to work in derm, uh, there's a lot more depth to go here. Right. So I'm kind of covering just the basics here, just the main drugs you're going to go over and a lot of the some of the pharmacokinetic principles that are going to be important when you're dealing with these um, these patients. So anyway. So what are some major variables here? How can you decide like what kind of effects we're going to be getting from the medications that we're applying to the skin, right? Because again, some cases, you know, uh, we're giving drugs and applying to the skin just to work locally, right? But does that mean the drugs only work locally? No, some drugs can be absorbed systemically. We can see that that can be a good thing for certain uh, drugs. So for instance, anyone ever heard of a duragesic or a fentanyl patch? That's a medication. It's a long-lasting medication. You can apply right to the skin, and it allows for the opioid to be absorbed through the skin, allow it to get into the, into the, um, the systemic circulation. It has its you know, effect of causing analgesia, right? Um, clonidine. We talked about clonidine in, in, uh, in regards to which disease state? <clears throat> Hypertension, if you remember that, right? Clonidine is a good uh, hypertensive medication. So we, uh, anti-hypertensive medication. And so we would apply that on the skin. That's one dosage form that it comes in. And again, it lasts, you know, uh, you know, several days worth uh, of drug. That way the patient doesn't have to go and change it all the time. It's one of those things uh, that's good about it. It's um, that kind of dosage form. But just remember that some drugs can be absorbed systemically. You really don't want that to occur. And a lot of it can depend on uh, where you're placing it, what type of vehicle you're going to be placing the drug in. And when I say vehicle, what do you think that means? Not like a Maserati or a high NDA. It's going to be like what kind of dosage form is it in as far as is it in a gel, is it in a lotion, is it in a cream? Um, that's what we call the vehicle. That's what's carrying the drug and allowing it to you know, stay in solution and actually interact with the skin there. So that's what I'm talking about when I say vehicle. <clears throat> Now, you might you know that we can have very um, variable absorption depending on where you place it, right? So, for instance, if you place, um, say, drugs onto the axilla, how do you think the skin thickness of that kind of uh, compares to, say, something like, I don't know, say, the bottom of your feet? It's much thinner, right? So you're going to get better absorption, right? And that's one of the things we'll, we'll see is that the thinner the skin you're going to be placing the drug, the more likely you are to see it being absorbed very easily, okay? Um, other things, looking at concentration gradients, right? So if you remember going back to that fixed law that we talked about in pharmacodynamics, anyone remember that? All right, fixed law was basically saying, you know, what is that flux that's going to occur across that membrane there? So we said thickness is one, right? You said that's inversely proportional, so we kind of covered that. The other big thing would be the concentration gradient, right? So the bigger the concentration is on the outside, the more it's going to drive that passive diffusion and cause it to cross over that membrane, okay? So bigger concentrations means bigger uh, drug absorption. This is going to be important when you're talking about uh, the steroids a little bit later on. We'll see that the higher concentrations are going to be much more potent. They're going to have much better actions. And then uh, also you can see more systemic effects because of that, right? Um, looking at things like dosing schedule, right? So oftentimes, you know, when you're looking at how fast of an onset you get, how do you fast do you think the skin is as far as absorbing drug versus, say, you know, other dosage forms or uh, uh, other routes, like, say, for instance, you know, IV, a lot slower. It takes time for that drug to cross over. It's not going to be a very instantaneous sort of thing there. Um, the flip of that is going to be true as well because the skin can actually act as a reservoir, kind of a depot um, sort of effect there. So, for instance, if I were to have a patient who was on one of those fentanyl patches uh, and I were to take it off, does that mean the drug is all of a sudden out of the system and I'm not going to get any more effect? Well, no, there's still going to be some of the skin that can be absorbed. Uh, you can still see some lingering effects from that. So that's an important thing to consider. But the nice benefit there is that you're going to have long-lasting effects, and that way the drug actually, depending on the which type of a patch you're dealing with or, or what type of drug you're dealing with, you may find that you only have to change it uh, once every day, maybe every three days, maybe every seven days. And so it can be good from a compliance standpoint. You don't have to think about it very often. Okay. So I mentioned uh, the vehicles, and also uh, we'll talk about the term occlusion. What do you think that means when I say occlusion? Hmm? 
Yeah, how, how like kind of a, a, a you know type of a covering do we have on something, right? So again, uh, if I were to say take um, you know a gel, put it on the skin, and I were to wrap it around the ace bandage, that makes it more occlusive than it was just kind of open to dry, or open to the air, right? Um, and so that can increase permeability as well when you cover something up. And so um, we'll see that the vehicle itself can uh, alter the the drug permeability pretty significantly. You're going to find that you know depending on whether the vehicles that we have are going to be more um, moistening, if they're going to be more drying, that can be playing a role here, right? Because what's the the general rule of thumb in, in dermatology. If it's wet, dry it. If it's dry, wet it, right? So that's going to be playing a role here as well. And one of the decisions you'll have to make as a provider is what type of vehicle do I want to place on this patient? It's enough, uh, not enough just to decide what drug you're going to use, but also what vehicle you're going to use in order to, to have that drug be effective for that patient, okay? Uh, the vehicle itself can be therapeutic. So if you're dealing with really dry, uh, irritated skin, having a nice moisturizing, um, you know, gel or lotion or something like that can be um, can be providing some uh, soothing effect for the patient as well. So the vehicle itself may be therapeutic. And then um, just think about, you know, the occlusion increasing the efficacy, which can be a good thing, or that can lead into things like toxicity. So did I ever mention um, the story about the um, the infant who had uh, accidentally had dad's pain cream put on, on the baby instead of the diaper rash cream, right? So think about that. Think about that young infant. Infant skin are typically what compared to adults? Pretty thin. They have an underdeveloped stratum corneum. So again, this is maybe like, you know, an eight-month-old uh, baby is right after bath time, you know, after a nice hot bath, the skin's nice and flush usually, right? So again, you're trying to dissipate some of that heat. So again, that very good blow flow to the skin. Mom slapped that pain cream onto the baby's butt and then went ahead and put a diaper over it. Guess what? Now we've added an occlusive dressing on top of that. And guess what that absorption did? It's very, very good absorption, right? So again, when they found the baby apneic a few minutes or uh, you know maybe an hour later, um, that was due to how well that drug was able to absorb because of those factors. So think about those sort of things um, when you're thinking about how well a drug is going to get absorbed in this, into the systemic circulation. And again, just if you don't remember, that baby ended up doing fine. Uh, at, at the end, we were able to intubate them and, and, and get them back once the drug was able to clear out of the system. But we did find measurable levels of those drugs that was in that uh, specialty cream actually in the bloodstream. So we definitely know that it was related back to that drug being absorbed through that skin in there. All right, um, so again, some, some considerations uh, regarding our vehicles here. So again, what's the drug solubility in the vehicle? Uh, that just basically means that the drug has to be able to go into solution, and so that can dictate what type of vehicles you have available, right? So something's not going to go uh, into an ointment very well. It may only be available as a cream. We'll look at some of the differences between oils and creams and, and whatnot a little bit later, um, but that's going to be one thing to consider. Again, how well can we hydrate that stratum corneum? If we want that to enhance uh, penetration, that can be one thing we're considering. And then also the other big thing is stability of the drug once it's in solution. Typically, once you put a drug into some sort of um, liquid medium, right, or some sort of um, you know cream or gel or anything like that, you tend to decrease the stability, right? So that's why a lot of times when you see drugs that are freeze dried is because by taking all the moisture out of it, it keeps the drug stable for a good long time. Here, when you put them into solution, they typically are going to be stable for a shorter period of time. They may make your shelf life a little bit shorter, but also includes um, the ability for bacteria and things like that to get in and can grow. That's why they have a lot of preservatives and whatnot that are included with that, just to make sure that we don't have any bugs growing in your ointment, right? No flies in the ointment, no bacteria in the ointment would be great, right? Okay. Maybe an outdated reference there. But looking at the different vehicles here, here's a good um, chart to kind of go back to as far as thinking about, you know, um, how drying or how moistening the different vehicles are going to be. Typically, when you're thinking about things that have alcohol in them, right? Ethanol tends to be much more dry because al alcohol typically does what pretty easily. And when it's kind of released out into the air, it evaporates, right? So when, again, when it evaporates, it's going to be taking some of that moisture along with it. And so it's going to be pretty drying for the most part. So think alcohol-based products, think very drying. All right, so which could be okay. It could be good if you have a really oozy um, kind of wound or something like that. That may be just fine. So that's where we're going to see the tinctures and wet dressing, things like that tend to be much more drying. And then as you go down, we're going to see things like um, gels and lotions. Typically, these are going to have a lot more water-based component. And we'll look at some comparisons a little bit, but again, those tend to be a little bit more um, uh, more drying. And then down to things like ointments, these tend to be the least drying. These are going to be much more uh, uh, suited for you know, things that are really scaly, things like that, really dry skin, like things like ointments are going to be better. And again, um, one of the other big things to look at here as well is going to be what's the patient satisfaction with the uh, or the patient acceptability of the different doses for them. So um, if you had to imagine, uh, have you ever dealt like Vaseline before? How does Vaseline feel in the fingers? Kind of oily and it's hard, really hard to wash off, right? You know, that, but that can be a really good, um, very good moisturizing sort of uh, product because, again, it's not going to go away very easily. It's going to stay right there. Uh, however, you know, if it gets all greasy and it gets on your clothes and everything, you think the patient's going to like that? 
not typically, right, versus something like a nice lotion, you know, more water-based, going to wash off pretty easily. That may increase patient compliance a little bit, increase patient satisfaction, but may not be best for that particular um, area of skin you want to apply it to. So again, these are all things you're going to be considering um, when you're deciding what's the best dosage form, what's the best vehicle for your patient. So just to give you an example of some different comparisons here. So imagine we have a cream, we have an ointment, and then we have like a gel slash foam, and then some lotions. Um, now, the big things to know here are basically the oil versus the water content. And again, a lot of these products tend to be emulsions, where basically an emulsion means that two things normally don't mix together, but we're going to kind of force them to, to mix together, either by adding some uh, additional um, products that kind of help that to occur, or maybe just physically, you know, just uh, forcing them together. Um, and so the two big ones you're going to find, they can either be an oil and water emulsion, which in which case that means the water is going to be in the higher percentage there, or it can be a water and oil emulsion, which means the water is going to be in the, the minority, right? It's going to be much more oily sort of base. <clears throat> So if you're looking at that, um, with the cream, you know, okay, it's going to leave um, some amount of uh, drug on the skin surface, but with uh, something like an ointment, it's going to provide more of this kind of protective oil film. Again, that can be good from some standpoints, from a therapeutic standpoint, no, maybe not great from a patient uh, acceptability sort of standpoint, right? And again, you don't have to memorize this entire um, chart here, but again, I want to show you some differences between these products to kind of let you start to think about, you know, what's going to be a good product for my patient, right? You know, things like, um, you know, locations on the body, you know, in some cases like ointments, you may want to avoid certain areas like, you know, um, you know, like the axilla, the groin, things like that, because the occlusion may be too much. You may see too much drug absorption um, versus things like, you know, creams can kind of go anywhere. Right. So, again, the, the occlusiveness of that dosage form is not too much there. Um, <clears throat> and again, occlusion is a big thing to consider here as well. Um, one other thing to look at, I'm just going to see. You know, sometimes, uh, especially if you're looking at, um, you know, things like very hairy skin you might have to be applying the drug to, oftentimes like the oil-based stuff tends to be much more difficult to work with from the patient's standpoint versus if I can use something like, you know, a foam or a lotion or something that's more maybe alcohol-based, that can be good to help kind of um, a lot to uh, dissipate much more quickly uh, for the patient. So again, all little things we'll talk about more as we get into specific drugs a little bit later. So first off, let's talk about acne. So what is acne? It's covered acne at all yet? From some people may have experienced acne at some point in their life, right? Everyone's been probably been a uh, pimply teenager, I imagine. Most people were. Anyone called pizza face? You don't have to raise your hand. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> listen, this is not the place for me to air my grievances from childhood. Okay. <laughs> Anywho. Um, Again, acne we know is going to be, um, it's a big multifactorial sort of disease state here, right? So there's a lot of genetic <laughs> factors. It can be racial factors, et cetera. Um, the four big things we're going to be focusing on, and this is why it's important to consider the pathophysiology, because the drugs are going to be attacking different points of, of the kind of the acne uh, spectrum here. So um, first thing you're going to be seeing here is going to be this kind of increased sebum production, right? Where do we see this sebum production occurring? actually in the hair follicles, right? So again, that's going to be producing the sebum. Um, you oftentimes will have this kind of alterization or alteration in the keratinization process. And so you're going to find this kind of uh, hyper uh, proliferation of this ductal epidermis, okay? I'll show you pictures here in just a second. The, the other big thing you're going to find is going to be the bacterial colonization. And so this tends to be an anaerobic bug called Propionum bacterium acnes. And then finally, there's going to be an inflammatory response to that, right? So basically, you're block, blocking off all these follicles. You're going to have this bacteria start to propagate in that sort of anaerobic environment that's been formed there. And then your body's going to react to that, right? So that's why it's more of an inflammatory sort of process here, in which case you're going to find that certain drugs like steroids might be a, a good option for some patients, right? You're going to see things like antibiotics are going to be good for helping to deal with the, the, the bacteria here. So you're starting to see there's different places where we can attack this process. In some cases, we may need to go more than one, right? Sometimes we'll need some combination therapy. Sometimes attack multiple um, pathophysiologic processes here to make sure we get better uh, overall cure for our patient, right? So, again, just looking at things like, you know, uh, environmental factors, um, certainly things like heat and humidity can affect things like the comedone formation there, um, things like pressure or friction. So that's why you see a lot, like, you know, a lot of teenagers and they play sports and they have like pads on and things like that. They may have acne that develops in those areas there. Um, a lot of times people don't realize that kind of excessive scrubbing or washing of the skin tends to dry the skin out, irritate it more, and can make uh, the comedones uh, formation a little bit more, more prevalent. So that's one thing to, to educate patients on. Um, you know, in some cases, this, uh, patients may do worse in the wintertime versus the summer. Uh, and of course, you know, things like, you know, physiological stress. Also, it's going to increase things like glucocorticoid production, which may inhibit your ability to actually fight off those bacteria from forming uh, there in the follicles. Right. So again, there's multiple things that are going to be playing a role with this. 
as I mentioned, um, when you see this pooling of the sebum, that's going to force that anaerobic uh, conditions to form. That's when you see those P acne start to, to proliferate there. And then that inflammation is going to be happening here is where you see a lot of um, things like the pus generation. You're going to see a lot of inflammatory cytokines starting to form in the areas here. Um, and so you can kind of see where, um, you know, it kind of breaks down to two main varieties, kind of the non-inflammatory, where you may have these like kind of open and closed comedones versus the inflammatory it tends to be a little bit more severe. You have these bigger like nodular sort of lesions there. Here's a picture um, kind of showing you the, the pathophysiology, how these are going to be happening here. Um, and again, eventually you can develop into these nodules or cysts that form there. And here's a picture I was kind of referring to where, again, you're going to have this increased activity of the sebaceous gland. You're going to kind of um, uh, form uh, this comedone, again, where the bacteria are going to start to proliferate. This is where you're going to find that inflammation start to occur, and this is where you're going to have a lot of the inflammation happen there where there's your body starting to respond to that, in, uh, that uh, you know, minor infection that's occurring there, uh, wherever it may be at, right? Okay. Another big thing to note as well is there's a lot of cases where we can actually have drug-induced acne. So it's good to know, you know, a patient comes up and they say, hey, you know, I just noticed my acne is getting a lot worse. Good to ask about new medications that may have started recently. Um, you know, and, and again, it may not be the most obvious list to you, um, but it again, depends on, on the patient, what their other disease states are, what may kind of cue into some of these. Um, but typically, these tend to be more formed on the trunk. Typically, they tend to start maybe two to six weeks after initiation of therapy here. Um, and again, you're going to find um, that... Um, Again, this is mainly with systemic corticosteroids, you're going to see this. Now, no hydrocortisone is going to be a, uh, a steroid we're going to talk about a little later. Um, not common for this to occur here, right? Because hydrocortisone is kind of wimpy as far as uh, uh, you know, corticosteroids go. Um, but again, what you're going to find is that uh, with systemic corticosteroids, you would think with a lot of these, if we're going to be causing acne by starting these drugs up, um, what's the main way to, to treat that? Then get rid of the drug, right? So again, if I could just discontinue the drug, that should hopefully fix the problem there. You have to be careful when you're using systemic corticosteroids, patients kind of developing that, because initially, again, corticosteroids do what to the infl inflammatory process? They inhibit it, right? So they're going to diminish that inflammatory process. Well, if I were to take that away, and I have all these P acnes that are sitting there growing around in, in these, uh, these cysts and nodules and things like that, what's the body going to want to do at that point? The inflammatory system will ramp up and want to, to attack that. So it may actually worsen effects when you take the corticosteroid away uh, due to this uh, kind of acute increased inflammation. So one thing to kind of note with that, it's another reason why you may want to maybe taper off those patients if they had to be on these um, chronically. But other drugs that can do this include things like antiepileptics, which again, we'll talk about those later on when we get to the neuro section uh, next semester. Uh, tuberculostatics, we've already covered when we uh, covered those in pulmonology. What are some example tuberculostatics? Remember? Ethambutol, rifampin, streptomycin can be one, isoniazid, parazinamide was the other big one. Yeah, so again, think of your, kind of your big four you're going to use mainly for, for TB on there. Those can cause potentially some uh, drug-induced acne. And then lithium is another one. Anyone remember what we use lithium for? And bipolar disorder, we're going to talk about that next semester. i uh, get into that, but yeah, it's another one uh, that can uh, worsen that. So... Looking at this, um, as, as far as our treatment goes, uh, you're going to see that, again, this is a chronic disease. We can't really cure it necessarily, but we can help to control symptoms. Um, typically, we want to start kind of early on, kind of get more aggressive treatment early, and then we kind of move them over to more of a maintenance phase, if you can, right? And again, as they have another flare-up, then you can maybe kind of get more aggressive and then and taper it back down. The idea is to use as few drugs and as uh, low concentrations for these drugs as possible. So that way, um, get down to the most minimal amount of drug exposure you can, and then if you need to ramp it up, you can ramp it up later on, okay? Um, again, if we can do things like reduce the number, severity of lesions, that's good. Uh, kind of slow down progression, prevent you know, any kind of long-term disfigurement that may occur here, again, with your more um, serious cases, and then, of course, avoiding kind of psychological suffering associated with uh, acne. <laughs> So um, biggest thing to shoot for as far as our targets go is going to be uh, shooting for these microcomedones, right? If we can kind of eliminate that occlusion in the first place, you kind of get rid of that anaerobic environment, and thus that P acnes can't really uh, continue to grow. So that's going to be one of the big things we're going to be shooting for here. Um, obviously, we're going to be shooting for non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic therapy. Again, using the combination here is going to be more synergistic and more effective than using either one by themselves. And we're usually going to be targeting multiple mechanisms of action here, okay? Again, targeting different steps of the process in order to get some synergies in there, okay? And for the most part, mild to moderate therapy is going to require just topical products. When you get more severe or, say, more uh, systemically spread, this is where you're going to get um, more systemic therapy, right? So, again, this is where you're going to find, like, tablets and uh, other things like that you're going to have to take in order to get systemic effects rather than just applying it to the area where um, you find the acne normally, okay? So, non-pharmacologic therapy. 
It goes here is going to be, um, first thing is going to be cleansing, obviously, right? So you can clean your face. Um, we use oftentimes uh, surfactant systems, right? So again, usually a lot of soaps and things like that. Um, they'll help to kind of uh, dissipate that fat and get rid of those oils that are on the face there. Um, however, you get to balance between using two, you know, kind of harsh products that may dry and irritate the skin. Um, and so it's why it's really important not to wash too frequently. So again, usually maybe twice a day would be good for most patients. Um, you don't need to like, you know, kind of scrub up every single hour like they have OCD or something like that, right? So again, just twice a day is probably fine. Um, and again, you might want to make sure you're not using too harsh of soaps because again, those can be very irritating uh, to the skin, okay? And then one thing to note as well is that how you time these products out. Because again, if you were to apply one, say, acne product, say a pharmacologic product, and then you try to wash the face afterwards, what's that going to do to that drug there? It's going to wash it away, right? And that may seem like it's pretty common sense, but again, common sense is not not all that common, right? So again, you want to educate patients, hey, here's how the order of things should go. You know, maybe wash your face first and then apply the drug, okay? And then also as well, a lot of soaps tend to be, have a high pH. Again, that may inactivate a lot of other products. So again, you want to make sure those are nice washed off, get rid of the soap, and then apply some other products if you need to. Okay. Um, again, with the topical therapy, just as a caveat, it's only going to work wherever it's being applied to, right? So again, I can't expect um, to apply, you know, say benzoyl peroxide to my face and expect it to work on anything that's on the shoulders on the back, right? So again, you want to make sure you're applying it right where it's needed. Uh, again, if we need, uh, if we have more, you know, kind of more, um, um, you know, diffuse sort of, you know, body-wide sort of coverage here, that's where systemic therapy is going to be better for, uh, for better for that. And just note that any of these products, the main side effect you're going to run into is going to be skin irritation, okay? This may cause a lot of patients to discontinue the product early. And again, you want to know that and let them call you up and say, see if you need to prescribe something else. Um, generally, though, what we can do is start with lower um, uh, percentage-based products and then gradually titrate them up to see what they tolerate. Um, and then also, if it's uh, being particularly irritating, try to use non-alcoholic um, solutions because, again, those can be tend to be pretty dry and can lead to more irritation, okay? Um, now, the other thing uh, with this is that a lot of patients probably have done what before they come and see you about this problem? problem? They probably tried some self-treatment, right? They probably tried some, um, you know, over-the-counter benzoyl peroxide. Like, so you want to ask also what they've used previously to see what's worked for them, what's not worked for them. Because, again, if they come in and they say, oh, I tried this benzoyl peroxide stuff, and you decide you want to give them that again, they're going to say, well, I didn't work before. But you at least say, well, you tried this concentration. Now I'm going to try to bump it up a little bit, see how it works. Or you can try something totally different if they were really just not tolerating the, you know, something uh, they had already tried. Okay? So little things to think about. Okay. So looking, uh, this is a good table to refer back to when you're looking at the different products and how they're actually going to be targeting the different pathophysiologic steps of acne formation here. So again, looking at things like the abnormal keratinization of the follicles, this is where things like salicylic acid are going to come into play. This is very similar to what other drug we talked about. Yeah, acetyl salicylic aspirin, uh, uh, acid is just aspirin, right? Um, things like benzoyl peroxide, which is a very common one that people have probably tried before coming in to see you. Uh, and also talking about topical retinoids and isotretinoin. Looking at the actual proliferation, this is where we're going to find that mostly our antibiotics are going to be playing a role here, but then also we can have things like benzoyl peroxide will have some anti-infective uh, activity. Looking at the inflammatory response is where we can sometimes see things like intralesional corticosteroids. So if you have like a really big cyst or nodule, you can sometimes inject steroids right into those to treat those. Um, some patients may need more systemic corticosteroids, so we'll look at that uh, briefly later on. And again, what do we say that corticosteroids can cause? Because acne themselves, right? So again, this is one of those things where you have to kind of balance it out between, you know, okay, well, why is the patient developing this in the first place? If I give them corticosteroids, is that going to make it worse? So we'll kind of look at some some things there with that. And then looking at the abnormal sebum production, um, this is where things like anti-androgens can come into play. When I say androgen, what are you thinking of? Like testosterone, right? So again, you think testosterone, dihydrotestosterone, sometimes giving anti-androgens can actually kind of help out with this. Have we talked about any anti-androgen drugs recently? Maybe with uh, some cardiovascular drugs. Spironolactone, right? So spironolactone is an anti-androgen, right? That's why we saw things like gynecomastia causing in men. Well, guess what? As an anti-androgen, sometimes we can see that being used for acne, right? So, again, all this is kind of coming back and playing a role. That's why I harp on these points so much earlier on, right? So that way you recall them now. Yes? Maybe? No? It's okay. We'll get there. Um, all right. So, anyways, we're going to go through and we'll look at all these different drug classes and how they're going to be used uh, to help manage acne here. So the first one is benzoyl peroxide. Most patients will probably try this, as I mentioned before, coming to see you. The way that it works, we think, is that it's going to actually uh, be penetrating down into the stratum corneum, and then uh, it gets converted over into actual benzoic acid. And that has pretty good activity against the P acne, as we mentioned, and also due to the keratinolytic effects that it has there, it's going to cause that peeling and a cumulolytic effect, right? So it's going to help to deal with that keratinization that's occurring there. 
Typically, a lot of over-the-counter preparations tend to be about 2.5% or so. So you can start there just once daily, and then you can try to titrate up as you go along to see how they're going to be responding to it, okay? Um, sometimes you may need to go to higher concentrations. Sometimes you're going to go to more frequent. I'd probably do one or the other and not necessarily kind of blast them with both the higher concentration and more frequent use because then it's hard to say, okay, well, which one was it really causing the effects we're seeing here? Is it more um, them giving too frequently and they got toxicity, or is it because of the concentration is too high? And then uh, the other thing to note is oftentimes using combination with a lot of other products. You may, again, the benefit of combination products is what? Better compliance, right? So again, they only apply one product, it's gonna be better than they apply two. And so here, um, do you see it uh, mixed with certain antibiotics like erythromycin, Clinda, that can also be very helpful from a compliance standpoint, right? Now, uh, as far as adverse effects go, one thing to note is that it can bleach hair. So again, notice if it's, especially if you had the acne kind of close to the hairline, that's one thing to note, make sure they're being very careful with how they're applying it. Uh, the clothes can be bleached as well. So you wanna be careful with that. And then as you uh, mentioned, any of these products, you know, skin, mucous, membrane, irritation, all gonna be uh, definitely on the table here, okay? Especially with the higher concentrations, more frequently they're giving it, much more likely to see that irritation occur. So um, sort of similar to benzoyl peroxide is going to be this uh, azelaic acid or azelax. Um, again, this is going to be probably working pretty similar to um, the benzoyl peroxide. One additional benefit it may have is it actually helps to convert, uh, prevent the conversion of testosterone over to dihydrotestosterone. So why do you think that's important? What do we say about DHT? actually more potent than testosterone, right? So again, even though it's maybe not acting as an anti-androgen, by inhibiting that conversion of testosterone to DHT, maybe you're at least getting a little less testosterone activity overall uh, than you would be otherwise, right? So again, another way we can kind of help with deal with that, that increased sebum production there, right? Um, again, start with once daily, see how they're tolerating, then you can go up if you need to, go more frequently there. And again, uh, with this one, uh, you can see some mild skin irritation, some dryness. Typically, it's going to go away over time. So over six to eight weeks or so of continuous therapy, typically they will kind of dissipate over time. Um, another kind of unique side effect here as well is this hypopigmentation that can occur, right? So a little bit of bleaching maybe of the skin is kind of what you're seeing there. All right. Uh, up next, we have the topical retinoids. Um, basically, these are going to be the acid form of vitamin A. Okay. And so uh, the first one we have here is going to be the retinoic acid, otherwise known as tretinoin. Or Retin-A is another uh, brain name you may see uh, used for this one. Um, now, this one, uh, again, we don't know the full mechanism of why we're applying this modified form of vitamin A, why it's causing, um, you know, it's anti-acne sort of effects here. But we do know, we do see that it helps to correct some of that abnormal uh, keratinization, helps to reduce the P acne's counts, uh, and helps as a kind of an anti-inflammatory, right? And so um, typically, if you have more non-inflammatory, um, you know, comedonal acne, if they have kind of failed all of the over-the-counter stuff, maybe the benzoyl peroxide is not a good option for them, this is where this can play a role. So retin-A can be very good for this. Um, and again, oftentimes uh, combined with other agents, especially more inflammatory acne here. Other cases where we may see this being used uh, could be for dispigmentation, also is useful for wrinkles. I remember one time me and my wife, we went on a, uh, a honeymoon cruise to Nassau. Guess what they have over-the-counter in Nassau? Retin-A. She was very excited about this. And I said, you don't have any wrinkles. And she says, I know, but I want to prevent any wrinkles. And I said, okay, whatever you want. <laughs> so she got some of that, but she's very excited about it. So uh, again, you may see it used for some other purposes and just for, for acne there. She still doesn't have any wrinkles, so go figure, right? Maybe, maybe it was working this whole time. But other uh, effects you're going to see, these tend to be, um, especially when we get to some of the more potent sort of uh, uh, vitamin A sort of analogs here, you're going to see that they tend to be very irritating to the skin. We'll talk about the, the last one, the systemic one that tends to be the worst here, but um, cause a lot of erythema, cause some desquamation of the skin, again, typically where it's being applied to, burning, stinging. Typically, this is a little bit reduced if you can apply some emollients, right? So an emollient is just what? Kind of just a moisturizing kind of product, right? So again, if you ever see things like Aquaphor or some other um, ones I'm trying to think of. Somebody's got no one off the top of their head. Aquaphor is a big one I always think about. I always say, like, if you want the really good stuff, you have to get the Aqua 5, but Aquaphor <laughs> tends to be pretty good, right? So, again, it's a moisturizing sort of product there. It can kind of help with a lot of that you know, skin irritation that's occurring, right? Other big thing to know is you're going to have a lot of photosensitivity and much more likely to get sunburn, especially in the areas that are exposed um, to the sun there. So, again, being in Florida, it's a big thing to, to let patients know about, right? And you also want to avoid this in pregnancy. So just as a caveat, anything that's screwing around with your fat-soluble vitamins like A, D, E, and K, you don't want to mess with those when you're having a pregnant patient, right? So like, just like we mentioned with like, say, warfarin, mess up with vitamin K, right? You don't want to do that in a baby, right? Uh, or a growing fetus. Um, same thing here. You want to avoid these in pregnancy. It's going to be uh, category X products uh, for those women, okay? 
And then um, with tretinoin itself, the other thing to note here as well is that it's photolabile, which basically means it's going to deteriorate in sunlight. Um, so that's why we actually want to apply this nightly to make sure that um, the product doesn't break down. And again, you don't know if it's just not working or the patient is not using it. You know, make sure they ask them and, and see how they're using it. So they say nighttime, that's correct. Um, Here's another case where benzoyl peroxide can actually inactivate tretinoin. So this may be a case where if you had a patient on both, maybe you start off with benzoyl peroxide in the morning when they wash their face, and at nighttime before they go to bed, they can just use the tretinoin, right? So that way they're not kind of competing with each other and you don't have the benzoyl peroxide inactivating the tretinoin, okay? So again, this is kind of the first one that we had to, to work with. Uh, some of the later ones we're gonna see actually don't have that, that limitation, and sometimes you can use them in combination um, either with benzoyl peroxide or you don't have to use them just at nighttime. You can use them during the day as well. So some of those other ones include things like adapalene, you know, things like uh, 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 tazeratine, you have allotretinoin, and then uh, baxeratine. These two are actually used for kind of non-acne sort of purposes here. You can see the baxeratine used for T-cell lymphoma. Allotretinoin gets used for Kaposi sarcoma, which is uh, something you may find in <laughs> HIV patients. Um, but the big ones you're going to find here are going to be things like adapalene and tazeratine. Now, again, the nice thing here with the dapalene is going to be stable in sunlight. You can use it with benzoyl peroxide. Um, Maybe more expensive, you know, uh, for, for your patients. So, again, you're making that call of whether or not tretinoin is good for your patient. Maybe a is better. Just really depends on, on the case there. But this also tends to be a little less irritating than the tretinoin. And then I have tazeratine. This can be a, kind of a third-generation retinoid, which is going to be used for, for acne and psoriasis. And, again, um, oftentimes you may find this being used with topical steroids, which we'll cover a little bit later on. And it helps to really reduce that skin irritation you see with that. Okay, um, moving on to antibiotics for, uh, for acne purposes. Again, not going to cover these two uh, extensively because, again, we've covered the mechanisms of action of things like erythromycin, clinda um, before, so I don't need to belabor those points. But again, as far as toxicity goes, how do you think this is going to differ compo compared to their systemic counterparts? Pretty minimal, right? So again, I wouldn't expect to see C. diff from a clindamycin using patient if it was only topical, okay? Uh, erythromycin, I wouldn't expect to worry about, say, a CYP3A4 interaction because it's only working topically. You really don't see a lot of appreciable systemic uh, absorption there, which, again, is why they're beneficial using, uh, using it from a topical standpoint, especially it's very limited scope, right? If it's just on the face or just in certain areas versus a very diffuse sort of disease. Um, that's a big benefit there. Um, again, skin irritation is a possibility. Maybe some uh, some dermatitis from that, but uh, for the most part, very well tolerated. Okay. So then when topical treatment isn't enough, this is where we need to switch over and use more systemic therapy, right? So again, if the disease is very severe or the patient, again, is very diffuse, this is where we're going to just kind of step up our game here a little bit. So first thing we'll talk about here is going to be our systemic retinoids. And so this is where we're getting to isotretinoin or Accutane. Have you ever heard of Accutane before? All right, so this one's a pretty serious deal uh, from uh, a drug safety sort of standpoint. And so uh, we'll talk about this thing called a RIMS program. Have I mentioned a RIMS program before? It's called a risk evaluation and mitigation strategy. And basically certain drugs are considered to be very dangerous either to the patient, either they cause a very severe side effect at such a rate, uh, you know, that is, is worthy enough to require certain types of monitoring, um, or it could be potentially dangerous to a fetus, or any number of things could quantify or qualify uh, a drug for a REMS program. Here, Accutane, or isotretinoin, why do you think we would include this in a REMS program? What do you think is a big dangerous thing we talked about just a minute ago with the other retinoids? Pregnancy, right? So again, because this is going to be very detrimental to the fetus, right? Kill off the fetus. We do not want to give this drug to anyone who might be pregnant. And again, who do you think, uh, what kind of age group suffers a lot from acne? Teenagers. Teenagers. And again, who might get pregnant? Teenagers. Right, hopefully not mine. When they become teenagers. And again, you can say, well, my teenager does not have sex. So I don't have to worry about that. Is that true? Probably not, right? So again, you hope your teenager is being, being straight with you, but it may not always be the, it may not always be the case. So because pregnancy can occur, you have to make sure that um, we don't give this to patients who become pregnant. So this is where we have something called the I pledge system, and this is specifically for isotretinoin or Accutane. Basically, what it means is that the provider has to be registered with the program, the patient has to be registered with the program, and the pharmacist has to be registered with the program. Actually, the whole pharmacy does. Um, that means that you have to go in. The patient will go in and get pregnancy tests done uh, routinely. Right, uh, they'll have education on making sure they've been provided education that says, "Hey, here's how you use um, you know prophylactics appropriately, uh, and all those sorts of things." Right, so that way, when I get the prescription, say I'm working at Walgreens and I have you know um, say little Sally coming in, you know, 16 years old, I will check with the I pledge program, to make sure she's had a recent pregnancy check done. If it's negative, then I say, "Okay, well this looks good. I can go ahead and you know the dispenses." Otherwise, I say, "Well, can't really give it to you. You have to go back to your provider, and make sure you get all the proper monitoring done." Okay, so it's very important because again, had she 
become pregnant in that meantime, she ended up getting the isotretinoin that can be very detrimental to that fetus, right? If not just um, causing miscarriage uh, outright. So, and that's not only just uh, the case for females, actually male patients have to be registered as well because there is some worry that you could have transferred the drug uh, through the semen. So that's another thing you have to make sure you uh, make sure male patients uh, have been educated, right? You don't have to really worry about pregnancy test for, for those male patients. So it differs a little bit based on gender, but that's one of those things we also uh, make sure the, the men, male patients are going to be uh, in the system as well. Does that kind of make sense? Yes, sir. Because you could have some drug transfer, right? So the drug's systemically administered, right? It's a tablet you take, and so it could you have some concentrations in the semen. If that were to be trans over, transferred over to the female patient, that could have teratogenic effects on them, right? Yeah, it seems nuts, right? But it's one of those things where um, that uh, the risk is high enough to say, well, let's just go ahead and make sure um, that we register these men as well and make sure they've at least been provided the education. So, you know, God forbid something happened, you can at least say, well, we educated the patient, we did X, Y, and Z to try to make sure we uh, limited our risk as much as possible. You know, the patient went out and just did something completely, you know, on, uh, uh, you know, something on their own and, and uh, unadvised, then we can't help anything about that, right? Yes, sir. They're trying to gen because they are affecting vitamin. So again, if you were to use these altered forms of vitamin A, um, it will kind of you know kind of replace the vitamin A that's already being used. Um, that's where you can see some of these effects occurring from. Well, not necessarily when the uh, before the uh, conception takes place, but they continue having sex. Right. Okay. right. That's where you can see some transfer. Right. Because, again, uh, it, could, it could be many weeks before the woman even knows she's pregnant, right? So, again, they continue having sex, and you know, it could be one thing where you could see some exposure there, right? So, again, these are things that may not even be um, clinically occur very often. So, for instance, there's a drug called clozapine that we use for as an antipsychotic medication. Its REMS program is to do with the fact that it causes agranulocytosis. You don't have to remember this for, for this test, but just know we'll cover it later. Um, but it's a very low risk. It's like 0.001% that it occurs. However, when it occurs, that will probably kill that patient. It'll probably get overwhelming infection because they have no granulocytes to, to fight it. Um, and so, in those cases, even though it could be a rare event, we still have them you know, in these programs to make sure we're doing the right kind of monitoring to make sure we try to limit our risk as much as possible, right? So again, uh, anyway, so uh, just something to note with that. Again, other things you're going to note, just like the retinoids applied topically are going to cause a lot of skin irritation, guess what? This is going to do the same thing, but much more systemically uh, seen, right? So you're going to see a lot of dermatitis associated with this, a lot of photophobia, right? You know, photosensitivity is going to be occurring with this. Um, this can even have effects on things like the nails and the hair, right? So again, it's kind of causing sort of like a, a vitamin A sort of deficiency uh, here, um, increase in serum lipids. Uh, and then also one thing to note, which may not really make sense based from a mechanistic sort of standpoint, can actually uh, worsen um, uh, signs of depression, right? So again, it's one of the things you want to make sure that, hey, you know, do they have existing depression? Could get worse. It could maybe uh, initiate kind of new depression uh, while they're on this. And again, mechanistically, I have no idea why that occurs, but this is something we see along with this drug, right? Uh, systemic antibiotics also have a role to play here as well. Again, better for more extensive disease, uh, difficult to treat disease. This is where we're going to see things like uh, tetracyclines get involved here as well. Again, who do we not get tetracyclines to? Pregnant women and yeah, kids less than eight, right? Because again, we worry about what? Teeth staining, bone effects, right? So again, that's what we're worried about there. So again, in, the nice thing with tetracyclines are very, very cheap uh, for the most part. You know, doxycycline, tetracycline can be very cheap, uh, very effective. Um, and again, mostly safe for the, for the most part there. One thing to note, though, um, again, watch out for those drug and food interactions, right? You don't want to take this with things like calcium or iron because those will bind up and then it may not be absorbed as well. Um, so again, watch out for that. Other things may get used a little less frequently. Um, we include things like Bactrim. We also use things like azithromycin, ciprofloxacin. Um, but again, far and away, probably tetracycline is going to be the most common one you're going to run into, tetra and doxycycline. Okay, some other therapies we may be able to use uh, for these patients include things like salicylic acid. Um, not a ton of, of, you know, strong, strong evidence we have for this. The main thing you're going to see with salicylic acid is it acts as a keratinolytic. This is why sometimes you can see also used for things like warts because it helps to kind of um, get rid of that tissue there, uh, that, that altered um, uh, keratinocytes, so we'll be able to get rid of those. Also may have some mild anti-inflammatory activity, just like aspirin would if we were to apply that systemically. Okay, um, Antiandrogens are used as well. We mentioned spironolactone being the main one you see with that. Um, some gels are available, so that can be good to help kind of limit those systemic effects, especially when you think about you know, giving an antiandrogen to, you know, say, uh, a developing male patient or female patient. You may see some altered effects there, right? So as I mentioned, the, the more masculinization of female patients, the more kind of feminization in the male patients. So you want to be careful with that. 
And then uh, with uh, oral contraceptives, we're going to talk much more about that in the ob guidance section next semester. Um, just know that it's useful in some women. However, with some women, when they start off oral contraceptives, what does it do to their acne? Can actually make it worse, right? So again, you have to play, uh, kind of play with it a little bit. It can depend a lot on not just the um, the estrogen that they're on, but also the progesterone is probably the more important thing you see with that, right? Um, so typically, you'd see patients be on like on something like ethanol estradiol or like a norethendrone. Um, again, you're when you're playing with these, um, you'll find that some patients really don't respond really well to one birth control, but it takes a while before you ever find the the right product for them. And a lot of it goes back to what progesterone they happen to be on. But again, don't worry so much about that now. Just know it's a possible option for acne, and we'll talk much more about those later in the next semester. Okay. Um, some other therapies, if you were to have, say, more um, you know, inflammatory nodules that are occurring uh, for your patients, this is where things like intralesional steroids can occur here. Um, now, just be aware that you can't see some systemic absorption. You do worry somewhat about adrenal suppression, not nearly as bad as you would see with, say, continuous um, systemic corticosteroids. Um, and it really, the big side effect you see with this is a lot of uh, local tissue atrophy. Again, better for those more kind of inflammatory sort of nodules. And then you can use oral corticosteroids. But again, typically you want to use this for very short courses. Typically, if they're having like kind of an acute flare-up of their acne, this is going to be good uh, to help kind of kind of tamp down that uh, that immune response and deal with that um, that inflammation there. Again, typically short courses are going to be uh, recommended here. You know, so say less than five days, five days or less, you know, is good. And we can use things like delta zone, uh, you know, dexamethasone. Any of these are going to be fine. Just like we talked about with their other disease states. And remember the side effects of steroids, which can include what? The hyperglycemia. What else? Osteoporosis is going to be like a more long-term sort of thing. Hmm? Immune suppression. Again, think about the, the mood effects as well. I can definitely see some altered uh, uh, mood, altered mental status can occur. With steroids, some people get really super um, uh, uh, sort of kind of aggressive when they're on steroids. Like they tend to be much more kind of uh, you know, quick to jump to anger uh, for whatever reasons. Again, not everyone's going to be affected the same way by these, um, but just know typically short courses, you don't have to worry about things like osteoporosis long-term, the uh, immunosuppression long-term, adrenal suppression. But again, if they're on it for longer than, say, five days or so, that's where you want to start thinking about those things and taper off gradually. Okay. Okay. So here's a good... Um, table just kind of showing you the sort of the stepwise approach you'd be taking when dealing with patients with acne right so again uh, i'm not going to have you memorize specifically what's type one versus type two like this is going to be for cms right it's not my class here but i do want you to kind of think about okay well what's the sort of stepwise approach i'm going to take with my patients in order to treat this right so for instance you know starting out with kind of the the wimpiest type of acne here we're using something like a topical retinoid right again may use plus or minus uh benzoyl peroxide salicylic acid those are going to be fine but again mainly focusing on topical therapy okay and again ask what they've tried before, see what they've had before previously, what worked for them, what didn't, what kind of side effects do they have, and then it can kind of guide you to choosing a new uh, good agent here. So again, topical retinol is probably the first one you're going to go with in a lot of cases. Uh, again, if it does not improve, this is where you can start to think about kind of uh, bumping up your game a little bit using two drugs instead of one. So maybe a topical retinoid plus a benzoyl peroxide, or maybe plus, you know, say uh, an antibiotic, okay? Typically topical at this point. And then if these are still not working, that's when then we're going to step it up to say something like, okay, well, this is where I'm going to use systemic therapy. Um, you know, this is where a systemic um, uh, antibiotics can be good. This is where I'm starting to think about maybe, um, say, a systemic uh, retinoid uh, could be an option here as well. So, again, think about the, the, the stepwise approach. Think about if I ask a test question, I come in and say, hey, patient's been on, you know, um, <clears throat> Topical retinoids and, you know, topical antibiotic, what would be another, what's the, what's the next step in therapy you might try? You know, and I could say, you know, some like intralesional corticosteroids. You'd be like, no, that doesn't sound like that would be the be right in that case there. They could try oral corticosteroids. Like, no, that's not really right either. You know, but I could say something like, you know, um, you know oral doxycycline. Okay, that's a good next step, right? You know, they've been on topical retinoid. They've been on benzoyl peroxide. Let's try to bump it up a little bit and use a systemic antibiotic. Okay, so something like that may come up on the test, right? <clears throat> Again, there's always where I hear the most typing. I say test and then something else. Always here. Okay. So any questions on that so far? Yes, ma'am. Well, I mean, you can tamp down those symptoms as much as you can, but then as soon as you're off of it, they come right back, right? So again, unless you've actually changed how that sebum production is occurring, unless you're changing um, that, that keratinization that occurs, you know, it could, you know, some people outgrow it, you know, some people are just going to naturally just not have to worry about that, especially once their hormones kind of kind of level out uh, at a point. But um, I don't know what I'd say that's really curative. I mean, you're dealing with the symptoms, right? Any other questions? All right, hopefully you've been using the sticky board. I can't wait to look at it. I, 
hope I'm not scared to look at it. Uh, but, uh, go ahead and take a 10 minute break and we'll come back and then uh, finish up our derm section. If you check the sticky board, you'll see I've updated some of the questions that were on there with some answers. So you can go back and I'll, I'll take a look at it like kind of right before class ends. Uh, we'll see if there's any questions to go through. Um, but yeah, I think that'll be useful maybe to some people, hopefully. No? Yeah, all right, we'll see. That's why you guys are my guinea pigs. I get to try it on you and see how it goes for next time. Anyway, um, any questions on the first half? Any questions? All right, so uh, moving on, continuing on with our you know, kind of uh, survey of dermatologic medications here. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about dermatitis. This is a good one because this is where... Anywho, for our uh, Schweppes explosion. Um, so this is a good place to talk about the, the steroids, right? Because again, eczema tends to be mostly an inflammatory sort of condition. So we can look at the steroids that are going to be very uh, uniquely suited to help to deal with that inflammation and try to, to kind of tamp that down. But um, again, some of the big things you're going to see with this, you know, a lot of pariatus, a lot of rash in the areas. Um, you know, oftentimes a family history can be involved with some of this, showing some uh, genetic predisposition here. Um, and again, you know, lots of other things you can do, especially with like looking at, you know, skin tests to see if certain triggers might be uh, involved with this. Um, I always love it when I'm going through, you know, kids' charts and I'm looking at, you know, verifying orders and stuff, and I see they're allergic to like 40 different things. I was like, oh yeah, they, they definitely went to the, you know, allergy office and uh, got skin tested. And so it's like animal dander and pollen and cheese and tomatoes and so every single possible allergy i'm like man how do they even live at all it's crazy but good to know what, you, what you're allergic to. anyway so our goal is here when dealing with someone with, uh, with dermatitis is trying to provide some of that symptomatic relief because again when you're in that dry itchy sort of skin like what do you want to do to it you know scratch it right what happens when you scratch it it's going to get worse right you're going to start to bleed it's going to get more inflamed it's going to get more irritated so again if we can do things that kind of help deal with that pariatus and help to deal with that that kind of um uh you know the uncomfortableness of it that's going to be good and that's where a lot of our steroids are going to be playing a, a big role here again we can try to prevent any future exacerbations that's going to be great and then obviously if they get secondary infections due to kind of this altered skin barrier that's going to be uh, good as well in case of developing kind of like cellulitis abscesses etc so looking at non-pharmacologic therapies, what are some things we can do to help soothe that skin? You know, things like lukewarm baths. We can apply things like lubricants, um, you know, after bathing can be really good. This can be really difficult in kids as well because you can tell them, hey, stop scratching, but guess what they're going to do? They're going to want to scratch anyway. You know, adults may be a little bit more likely to follow, you know, some of these, these points here. But other things like keep the fingernails short. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever dealt with uh, baby fingernails, but they are probably the sharpest substance on the planet. <laughs> Uh, especially when they grab you right by the septum, it, uh, boy, does it hurt. <laughs> other things that can help though, um, think about, you know, what other drugs did we use for itching previously? Like Benadryl, right? Benadryl is what type of drug? Antihistamine, right? It's the first or second generation. First generation antihistamine means it gets, you know, into the CNS. What was the main side effect of first generation antihistamines? sedation right so this can be good because it can help if you can kind of knock those patients out a little bit especially little kids and kind of knock them out a little bit helping keep them from scratching quite so much um that can be really good addition in addition to helping with the itching right so kind of both of those things can be working kind of to our benefit here the other thing is you're going to try to distract the kids uh, which again uh maybe plus or minus how well you're able to do that and then obviously if you can uh kind of find the allergens or the the irritants get rid of those if you can if it's changing the soap if it's changing you know whatever they might be exposed to that's going to be very helpful there right and try to maintain good hydration as well but getting into natural drugs typically corticosteroids are going to be the um the gold standard here and so the drug that we're going to choose you're going to find there's a whole cornucopia of uh, different steroids we can use especially topically um, in order to treat uh, dermatitis here and so uh, a lot of it depends on the severity of disease a lot of it depends on the site of disease so we kind of break these up into low medium uh potency steroids and then we're going to find even kind of the the very potent and then the kind of the ultra potent we're going to find there's kind of a wide variety here there's a lot of gray in between these um, but in general low potency steroids are going to be better for areas of thin skin, right? So if you need to apply something to the axilla, to the groin, to the scalp, uh, infants, use a low potency steroid. We're going to cover kind of which ones fall into that category there. Um, this is better for long-term therapy because the more, uh, the less potent it is, the less likely you are to see a lot of systemic effects, the less likely you are to see a lot of the kind of local skin effects, which we'll talk about here in a moment, um, are going to be, they're going to be better for kind of long-term therapy. 
the ideal thing would be to, if you especially were having someone like kind of an acute flare for their dermatitis or eczema, start with a higher potency steroid and then eventually get them down to one of these low potencies. That's always going to be kind of preferable in those cases there. Okay. More medium potency um, agents are going to be better kind of used all over, you know, better used for like, you can say, like trunkal areas, areas we're not really too worried about. Um, increased systemic absorption is going to be better for that. As I mentioned, you know, for worse exacerbations, maybe bumping it up to, say, a medium or a high potency and then scale it back um, after, we'll say, one to two weeks or so. So typically when you're looking at uh, topical steroids, uh, the big adverse effects you're going to be looking for tend to be more systemic in nature, especially the, the more um, the potent agents you're using, the larger the skin area that you're going to be covering. Um, the, the different vehicles that you may use to try to increase penetration um, uh, all can affect how much systemic absorption you're going to see here, right? Um, also, the duration as well, right? The more duration, obviously, the more drug can be absorbed in those cases there. Typically, when you're looking at the vehicles, um, things that are more oil-based, things like the ointments, tend to be the most occlusive, which means they're going to stick around for the longest, which means they're going to have the most contact time, the most exposure, the most absorption, okay? Creams will be a little less than that, and the lotions will be kind of the least out of the bunch, okay? So, again, if you're thinking about, you know, limiting side effects, maybe going with something like the lotion or or cream versus using an ointment for those patients. Typically, uh, locally, you're going to see some skin atrophy. It's going to be one of the main side effects you see with that. Uh, may see some allergic dermatitis. Most of the time, this is going to be related to the vehicle. So sometimes switching products may be able to help uh, alleviate a lot of that. And then uh, may uh, uh, see some, some rosacea developing there. Acne can occur as well, especially wherever it's being um, um, uh, being applied to. Uh, and then systemically, again, with the more potent agents, we're going to see a lot more absorption. Um, adrenal suppression is going to be a concern. Infections, as we mentioned, hyperglycemia, all these things we've kind of alluded to, just like you would see with dexamethasone given systemically, prednisone. This can all happen with the uh, topically administered products as well. So here's a good chart. I'm going to include this in the slides here. But again, if you ever want to go back and kind of see it on the actual um, the website itself, it's on psoriasis.org. And again, psoriasis is another case we're using a lot of topical steroids. These are going to be very uh, helpful to kind of give us an idea of where these different steroids fall into um, place here. So one thing to note, um, and again, I'm not necessarily going to ask you specifically, is this one a moderate or a potent one? You know, I think on either ends of the spectrum, the extremes here, I think it's good to know whether this is an, uh, a super potent one versus a, a, a very mild one. I would expect you to know that, but I would more uh, expect you to know sort of the um, the things that would lead you to choose a moderate potency steroid versus, um, say, a more mild one, right? So, for instance, if I said a patient, you know, is maintained on or uh, on systemic, I'm sorry, uh, topical hydrocortisone, but they're having exacerbation of their eczema, what would you bump up to? You know, to say like, you know, a moderate one. Uh, potent one, you have, well, you said, okay, well, they're on a mild one, let's go ahead and bump it up just one. Let's go to a more moderate uh, uh, corticosteroid there. So things like that you may want to consider. But you'll know, especially when you're dealing with things like hydrocortisone, this is the most widely available um, topical corticosteroid. Again, if you go to the CVS or the Walgreens, you're going to see it all over the place. And again, the big thing to note here is that there's going to be a lot of different concentrations, a lot of different dosage forms available. So keep an eye on that. Make sure you're thinking about the vehicle you're prescribing. Think about the concentration. Also, you're going to find that different salt forms will have uh, different potencies associated with them, right? So I'll show you an example of that in just a few moments here. Uh, show you how you can have different hydrocortisone. Some may be just a mild, some may be more moderate, depending on the salt that we're using. But big ones to note here on the, on the mild side, hydrocortisone tends to be pretty mild for the most part. Very uh, hard to go wrong with this one. May not be the most effective, but again, from a systemic standpoint, um, very little effects. Again, topically, you're not going to see a ton of effects compared to any of these other agents here, right? Clobetazole tends to be in the very, very potent category. Again, if you're unless you're working in derm, I probably wouldn't recommend you prescribing this because, again, there can be um, that bigger risk of, of having that systemic absorption. Uh, unless you're dealing with these all the time, probably best to stay away from this one, right? So, uh, and again, you don't have to memorize, because look how many different options we have here. Way too many, right? Just, and again, when you work with these uh, to some degree, especially if you were to work in derm, like you'll have your usual bunch you're going to be dealing with, right? You may have three or four or five that you're going to be uh, prescribing on a regular basis. You'll get used to it, you kind of know. But um, note that a lot of these we've already seen before, um, especially either uh, in the ophthalmic corticosteroids or we're talking about the inhaled corticosteroids. A lot of these are going to pop up again, as you've already seen here. Begin starting with the uh, super potent, the most common ones you see here, and include things like clobetazole, uh, betamethasone kind of props up in this category here. And then you kind of go down in the less and less potency, as you're going to see here. Again, this is just a different way to categorize it, uh, as opposed to that last slide where we saw where um, kind of went on a stepwise upwards approach there. One thing I do want you to note uh, from this 
are going to be things like, you know, your hydrocortisone creams, right? So our hydrocortisone in general. And notice here, you know, a lot of different percentages. So again, if your patient is coming in with eczema, ask them what they used before. And if you can't try to ask them what percentage were they using, they may not know, but if they can take a picture of the product or they say, you know, if this is a specific brand name, maybe they can give that to you and I'll kind of clue you in as to what it actually is. Um, but just know the different um, salt forms may uh, include something in the mild category versus say a lower mid strength. Um, but again, you'll get a feel for this as you use them, especially in your derm rotation, you kind of get an idea for kind of what they're prescribing. So again, I'm not going to ask necessarily, you know, is this one fit into a class five versus class six? Now, Dr. Nicholson may ask you to know some of that stuff, but again, I'm not going to get that granular with it um, because um, a lot of the stuff you can look up, right? You can look up a chart and see where these things fall into, but kind of knowing, okay, what's the difference between a mild versus a more potent one, right? What are the differences I'm going to see in toxicity? What are the differences I'm going to see as far as efficacy goes? Those things I do want you to know, right? What's the difference between if I use a lotion versus a cream versus an ointment? Those are the things I want you to know, right? It's more kind of conceptual based uh, because again, there's a whole potpourri here. And again, if you ask me, if you put a gun to my head said, which one does uh, beta-methasone dipropionate 0.05% lotion fall into? I just looked at it. I couldn't even tell you right now, right? <laughs> So again, but I don't work with these uh, drugs all the time. If I worked in Durham all the time, I would probably know it, uh, you know, secondhand, you know, just like the back of my hand. So um, again, those are the things I kind of want you to know. Does that make sense? Hopefully, yes. Yes, sir. So I uh, understand you're right. Stuff like ointments versus creams, mm -hmm. and you also said as far as the drugs, don't know the main classes, but instead just be able to determine when you would use like a mild or some moderate. Yeah, things like that. Or, you know, if the patient's on a moderate and they were coming with an exacerbation, what would you, what would you do? Would you... Take them down to a, a mild, probably not, but maybe bump them up to a, a potent one, right? Um, you know, things like that. I would definitely know that hydrocortisone is the, the mildest one you have, right? That's going to just be the one you're going to see most often. You know, things like clobetazole, that one's going to be a super potent one, right? Everything kind of in the middle, like, you, you can look that stuff up, right? Um, and again, I'm not going to get quite so granular. Now, I may ask you, you know, which one of these drugs would be appropriate for treatment of psoriasis, right? And then, so I can have, um, say, you know, three drugs for acne, and then I have something like, you know, um, you know, desinide, like that one I would want you to at least be able to recognize that, hey, this is a, a steroid, right? So that would be appropriate for, for topical dermatitis, right? Something like that. That makes sense? All right. Again, I usually go with the most common stuff, right? So again, there may be a, a question that gets down into the, the, the nitty gritty. Um, but again, typically I try to be pretty fair with these questions. I haven't had too many complaints about my derm lectures before. So hopefully I don't, don't, don't start any of this time, right? Anyway, some of the things we can do, let's say we don't want to use steroids. Let's say we're worried about using steroids due to concern for toxicity systemically. Say lots of different things we're concerned about. There are some other agents we can use, and we call these topical immunomodulators. Basically, just mean it's modulating the immune system. It's doing something and modulating different, um, you know, trying to change it a little bit. And so this is where we run into something called uh, tacrolimus, and we also have pemecrolimus. Now, um, tacrolimus, you will see this being used systemically in cases where you need to modulate the immune system, and that can be used a lot in times in transplants. So you'll see tacrolimus being used uh, for transplant patients to prevent graft-versus-host disease. You may see this being used for certain autoimmune conditions, like, you know, you may see this being used for, um, say, lupus nephritis or other things like that. So anytime, anything where you need to kind of tamp down the immune system, maybe not as uh, dramatically as with a corticosteroid. Uh, this one tends to be a little bit more specific in this mechanism, maybe limiting some of the side effects you see for that. So again, they are going to help with reducing the extent, severity, and symptoms uh, related to the dermatitis here, and they work by kind of inhibiting the activation of T cells, mast cells, and keratinocytes. They're not working as uh, you know as potently as a steroid would because they're not working at the side of the nucleus, but they can work you know directly here to affect these mast cells and T cells. Now, um, again, these are going to be second line after topical corticosteroids if that's not going to be a good option for your patient. Yes, sir. Do these have similar mechanisms of action for patients? Um, it would be pretty similar. Yeah, you can kind of lump them into the same. They may have a little bit different actions as far as um, the actual mechanism, but you can kind of think about them as a, a immunomodulator as well. And again, cyclosporin, we said we also use systemically for things like transplant and, and whatnot, right? So definitely you can kind of lump them all together as, a, as a, an immunomodulator for sure. But um, again, this is going to be uh, patients you want to avoid this in. This is going to be those with, um, you know, those that may be at risk for cancer, you know, because this ha could have some cancer risk associated with it. So again, probably not that uh, big of a deal for most patients, one thing to consider. And then also those with a weakened immune system, this is going to worsen that, right? So again, if they're already immunocompromised, this is going to worsen that. Um, one big thing to note here as well is it's going to cause, um, it's pretty uh, bad from a skin irritation sort of standpoint. And in fact, they get very photosensitive. So they really have to use high SPF sunscreen uh, to make sure that they can um, you know, prevent any kind of photosensitivity, try to prevent um, any, any significant sunburning going along with that. So again, it's one thing to definitely educate patients on. 
Okay, and then uh, as I mentioned, oftentimes if uh, they're having an acute flare-up, they're having acute exacerbation, especially more diffuse disease, this is where ortico oral corticosteroids are going to be good here. This is where we're doing that kind of that pulse dose ster uh, steroids where you give, them to a, uh, give it to them for a short course of time, maybe five days, maybe two weeks or something like that, um, in, in order to get that, uh, try to tamp down that inflammation, kind of get them back to baseline, and then you transition them back over to whatever they were on chronically, whether it be their hydrocortisone, whatever it happens to be, right? So again, same thing we've already seen, could be dexamethasone, prednisone, you know, methylprednisone, Alone, medical dose pack. It really doesn't matter which one you use. Um, they're all going to be working pretty similarly to one another. Okay. The dosing is going to change a little bit, but other than that, not a whole lot. Okay. Uh, some other topical antibiotics you may run into on occasion. So things like bacitracin. I'm sure most of you probably use bacitracin at some point in your life, right? So good for a lot of cuts, scrapes, all the good stuff. Um, you know, it will work basically by as a peptide antibiotic, which means it's going to inhibit cell wall synthesis. Now, notice we did not ever cover this really for uh, systemic uh, antibiotics we talked about previously, because really when you give it systemically, the side effects are too intolerable, a lot of organ toxicity, but great to use uh, topically. You get a pretty wide coverage of things, so we can get things like you know, strep and staph, which we know on the skin, typically what grows. A lot of gram positives, right? Like strep and staff, right? Um, it's also can get things like you know, anaerobic cocci, can also get things like tetanus bacilli. Why would that be important for things like wounds? Say I fall down, I scrape my knee on the ground. That's where tetanus likes to grow, right? So again, tetanus is a sort of anaerobic sort of bug that likes to grow in those environments. And so typically with like, you know, especially traumas and things like that, like this is good because you worry about introducing bugs from, say from like the soil into the into the wounds. And that's where they can then um, kind of propagate and cause uh, some issues there. So um, you'll learn about wound botches at uh, some point later on. Now, typically bacitracin is either used by itself or it can see it in combination. So if you ever see like a double antibiotic ointment or a triple antibiotic ointment, usually a triple antibiotic ointment is also known as, anyone know? Neosporin, right? So you see neosporin is typically the three drug combination. So usually it's either bacitracin plus neomycin or bacitracin plus neomycin plus polymyxin B, right? It just widens out the coverage. And again, do you think we worry about um, uh, resistance when using something like this topically? Not typically, right? Because again, you're going to find that using such high doses of it, the concentration's high enough, you really don't have to worry about the resistance issue. You really don't see any problems with that, right? Um, the only thing to really note here is you may see some allergic dermatitis associated with it. You don't really worry about systemic uh, exposure here, but again, it could have an uh, irritation to it. Typically, if people are going to have an uh, irritation, it's going to be due to the neomycin aspect of it, right? Neomycin falls into the immunoglycoside category, um, but just like we saw with um, using if you remember back to our ENT talk, we were talking about using um, neomycin, hydrocortisone, polymyxin B uh, eardrops, uh, cortisporin eardrops. Uh, the neomycin was oftentimes a thing that people had kind of an allergic uh, dermatitis to, right? Now, why we may not want to use that for some patients. Same thing applies here. Uh, another good one you may see occasionally, especially in the hospital settings, is going to be mupirocin or Bactroban. Um, this has really good activity against um, gram-positive aerobes, so especially MRSA. So if you do, say, like a, um, a nasal swab on a patient coming into the hospital and they grow MRSA, typically they're going to be put on um, uh, mupirocin, right? It's a very common thing we use in, in the hospital there. It's used to kind of eliminate that nasal carriage of, of, of staph aureus there. Um, again, may cause some mucous membrane irritation, but not absorbed systemically. Not a ton of side effects you're going to see from this one. Uh, as I mentioned, polymyxin B, again, this one's good because it uh, kind of interrupts that uh, cytoplasmic membrane. Now, if you remember, we talked about this one briefly as far as systemic uh, antibiotics go. Remember the toxicity that was associated with that? Yeah, it can cause issues, especially if you're using with paralytics uh, as far as like neuromuscular function, ototoxicity, nephrotoxicity, CNS toxicity, lots of problems with this drug. But again, using it externally, you limit a lot of that, right? So you don't have to worry about that so much. Um, however, if you were to use it, say, on very large areas, of wounded skin or say denuded skin, um, this is an area where you would uh, tend to worry about uh, more of that uh, absorption there. So for instance, if I had a test question, I was asking you had a very large wound, you wanted to cover with antibiotic ointment, um, you know, you were worried about absorption, which drug product would be best? And you may say, well, let's use something like, you know, just single antibiotic ointment, I'll just use bacitracin as opposed to using something that includes polymyxin B, right? Um, because again, I worry about that, that neuro and that nephrotoxicity, okay? Again, clinically, not often it's a concern, but if you were to work in like a trauma unit or something like that, where you have people coming with really big wounds, that would be something you'd want to uh, think about, okay? And then as far as immune glycosides go, you may see some gentamicin, but far and away, I'll probably see neomycin is the most common one here. Um, again, can have some systemic accumulation, but um, the more big thing to think about is that that, irritate, um, that sensitization, that kind of contact dermatitis you can see with neomycin. It's probably the most common one you're going to see uh, that occur with. Okay. Um, again, we're just kind of covering some, some miscellaneous products. We have some topical 
antifungals. Uh, what's some of the issues with using uh, topical antifungal products? How quick do you think they kick in? Or how long do you have to treat for? It's a long time, right? So you're, you're talking about several weeks to months potentially in order to treat some of these things, especially like, you know, um, uh, you know, like toenail fungus and things like that, they tend to take a long time to treat. And so do you think people actually stick with it and treat the whole time? No, right? So there's a lot of recurrence of disease, but here are the ones we typically use uh, most frequently. Again, these are in their topical forms. Uh, some of them we've already talked about as being used more uh, systemically. Again, the same things kind of apply here, but we limit a lot of those systemic side effects. So we have things like clotrimazole, ketoconazole, Again, these are going to be working to inhibit that fungal P450 to prevent uh, the fungal cell wall synthesis. That's how these drugs are going to be working here. Um, I mentioned these here because you can see a lot of these being used for um, either topical purposes or uh, potentially you can see things like vaginal uses. You can see like vaginal tablets or creams or things like that. Um, it's good for vulvovaginal vaginal uh, candidiasis there. Sometimes we may combine them with corticosteroids to help you deal with um, some of the inflammation and help it provide uh, kind of quicker symptom relief, but it just depends. And then typically uh, treatment is going to be pretty prolonged, say like two to three weeks or so, depending on what you're treating, what kind of dosage form you're using, et cetera. Okay. And again, adverse effects wise, what, what would we worry about with these drugs if we were to give them systemically, you think? Remember ketoconazole, well, how does it work as a drug? Inhibits fungal set P450. So what does it do to us? inhibits our CYP450, right? So remember those drug interactions, at least all those with a lot of the antifungal, uh, the azole antifungals. Um, again, you don't worry about that here because again, we're using them topically, right? So don't worry about systemic absorption. Now again, you may wonder, okay, well, what about, you know, if you're using it um, intravaginally, you may see some absorption, but clinically it doesn't really come up too frequently as that uh, causing significant drug interactions, right? Uh, another one here, we have uh, cyclopyrox or pin lac. Um, this one's uh, kind of interesting. It's uh, kind of like a nail lacquer. You can apply for, for nail fungus. Uh, so you can either do it on the fingernails, toenails. Um, it's kind of nice because uh, this is kind of this varnish where it's going to be sticking around for longer. You get better uh, contact time there, which can be uh, beneficial. Um, now, again, uh, a lot of these tend to not work great. And again, a lot of the studies probably show that, you know, compliance is just a bigger role to play here as it just being very difficult to treat these, um, these nail infections here. But this is where we uh, are going to use this most frequently. A couple of allylamines, we have naf, uh, uh, naftaphine, we have terbinafine. Um, these are going to be, again, working to uh, just be a slightly different mechanism here for some of these fungal nail infections. Um, things like, you know, ergosterol synthesis is going to be inhibited. So a little different activity than the azoles, but they still work uh, to inhibit that cell wall synthesis for the fungus. Again, mostly just some irritation. Um, again, we have tolnaptate. Um, this one's pretty well tolerated for the most part. Um, it's good for a kind of long-term therapy. Um, uh, and again, we kind of lead them on it long-term because otherwise we are going to see recurrence of disease if they don't treat for kind of the full uh, time frame there. Um, one thing to note, the uh, tolnaptate has no candida activity. So if you're worried about something like that, we'll not cover that. Um, and the one here uh, called nystatin. Now, we talked about nystatin before. What do we, we use that for? Thrush. was kind of the benefit of using it. Yeah, um, if you swallowed it, what would happen? Nothing, right? Because it actually doesn't get systemically absorbed. So this is actually, uh, we use this topically as well. This is actually a powder. Um, and so we can either apply this for things like, you know, and we have nice statin creams and ointments and whatnot. So good for like, you know, diaper rash. Um, also, you know, if we have patients who are having um, some irritation around like, um, um, you know, things like, you know, G-tube sites or, um, you know, trach tube sites or things like that, sometimes we'll actually apply a nice statin powder around that and actually help to prevent any kind of fungal uh, growth there as well, any kind of candidal growth. Okay, and then just uh, real briefly on some topical antivirals. Um, again, we've covered these already. We have things like acyclovir uh, and pencyclovir. Remember how these work? Where they're kind of inhibiting that, that uh, viral DNA synthesis, right? Because they're kind of subbing in for guanosine. And so if you can't incorporate that into the DNA, they're actually active as those chain terminators. You can't produce new viral DNA in those cases there. Uh, typically, these are used for things like cold sores, you know, so uh, herpes simplex one and two. Um, and again, just can be applied directly uh, there. Again, some irritation, but uh, you limit a lot of the side effects you see from, say, like, you know, systemic um, acyclovir. You may need to use it for more severe cases, but if you can get it with topical, it's always going to be a better route uh, for some of those patients. And then one final one, uh, this is another immunomodulator. This is actually going to be good for um, treatment uh, of warts. So you can use this for uh, external or perianal warts. Um, this one's called Aldera or Amiquimod. Uh, it's actually kind of stimulating. And, so, and, you know, uh, as a direct comparison to something like, you know, tacrolimus, which actually kind of inhibited T cell function, this is actually stimulating on the opposite end, stimulating the immune system to actually attack, um, you know, the, the virus causing uh, uh, warts. So, again, working on um, stimulating macrophages, tumor necrosis factor, alpha, interleukins, all these things are kind of getting upregulated uh, and, and can help to, to fight out the, the virus causing the warts there. 
Again, uh, you're going to see basically skin irritation in almost all these patients because you're kind of uh, giving them a pro-inflammatory. Uh, so just be aware of that. And so again, you can see, um, you know, definitely more ulcers, erosions, things like that occurring. And so you want to be careful as patients. Now, the more kind of side effects you're getting, obviously, the more effective it's being because it's ramping up the immune system. But um, just be aware that uh, it may lead to kind of early discontinuation. The patient can't really tolerate it. Now, uh, does anyone know what the one of the best over-the-counter, not even drug, uh, ways to, to deal with warts is? Duct tape is actually really good. So you can use duct tape to fix anything, and that includes warts. And so if you actually look at a lot of like over-the-counter products for um, for wart treatment, um, duct tape works just as well as any of them, right? So obviously, you know, cryotherapy is very, very effective. Um, but again, if you have a patient that's not a good candidate for that, or they don't want to, uh, duct tape can work pretty well. Yeah, you basically put it on, <clears throat> and we'll leave it there for a period of time, and then kind of apply it multiple times a day. It's not like you're like sticking on and ripping it off like necessarily. <laughs> um, but again, for whatever reason, it has you know, kind of these keratinic effects um, that will kind of work over time. Yep. Pretty interesting. Huh? I mean, it'll rip it away once you're pulling it off, but you have to leave it there and give it kind of time to, um, I don't guess, get it macerated and get it ready to kind of pull some of that, that skin away. So, again, it's not. not. It'll, it'll pull off layers, yeah, but again, it's going to have some time to actually like, deal with that keratinization that's happening there on those warts. Why do warts have such a propensity to grow in that same place? Like, again. I have no idea. Yeah, um, maybe you didn't get rid of the virus fully. Uh, I'm no wartologist, so I could not <laughs> tell you more definitively than that. Yeah, yeah it's a good question. Uh, maybe up to date has something about that, or it's a good, good idea to check that out. So, I don't know. Anyway. Again, I am fallible, and I don't know everything, so that's the first step. And sounding smart is you really don't know everything and just try to sound smart regardless of that, right? Anyway, uh, any questions on the derm stuff? Okay, so oncology is pretty long, so I'm actually going to go ahead and get that started. I'm very sorry. I only have 25 <laughs> minutes, but stick with me. Okay, so here we're talking about oncology. Have you started any oncology stuff yet? Yes? No? Just a little bit. Have you had a lecture yet on oncology? Okay, so from some nothing, I'm going to build you up. <laughs> okay, so what is cancer besides an astrological sign? <laughs> Uncontrolled cell growth, right? So basically our cells are growing unchecked, okay? Um, and so basically you're seeing this issue with cell growth, cell division is being, uh, happening unchecked, and also differentiation, right? So sometimes the cells will actually change function, uh, and again, not even look similar to what their kind of original host cells kind of were in the, in the first place. Um, and again, you're going to find um, that they have issues where they have increased expression of things like growth factors. They're going to have um, things like these increased cyclin-dependent kinases, which help them to kind of grow unchecked. You also have a lot of decrease in the P53 gene. Anyone know what that was uh, useful for? causes apoptosis, right, which is that programmed cell death, right, the cell suicide. Um, so if you were to decrease expression of that gene, you have a cell that normally would say, hey, I need to undergo apoptosis, but it doesn't do it, right? So again, it continue to grow, continue to replicate there. And they also lose what's called contact inhibition. Anyone know what that is? Yeah, so basically the cells normally when they kind of get crowded around one another, they say, oh, yeah, I'm kind of, you know, don't have enough space here to continue growing. Let's go ahead and stop, right? So getting contact with other cells will kind of inhibit replication. They lose that, and they continue to grow regardless, right? So that's one of those things, you, uh, another thing you'll see with some of these cancerous cells. So, um, again, the etiology, there's a ton of different things that are out there that could be playing a role here. So, again, we have things like, you know, carcinogens would be playing a role. There's genetic factors here. Lots and lots of different things. Um, and, again, um, we're going to find that uh, depending on the specific um, cancer you're going to talk about, you can get into different etiologies and different things are playing a role. One big thing to note is, um, you know, talking from a pharmacology class, guess what? A lot of the, uh, you know, cancer drugs we have here, guess what they cause? and cause their own secondary malignancies, right? So again, especially a lot of these earlier um, drugs that we were using, a lot of the ones that kind of just go through uh, and cause cell mutations um, can lead to cancer in and of themselves, right? So that's one of the big problems we'll, we'll see with that. Um, but certainly other drugs uh, you may not think about may also have kind of pro-carcinogenic sort of effects there, but all, it all depends. So anyway, I'm not going to get into that necessarily, but just to get some ideas of different types of, um, you know, known carcinogens. And again, this is more from a specifically, say, like a, a drug sort of standpoint. Things like anabolic steroids, right? So when I say anabolic steroids, what do you think of? Things that build up muscle. What's the big one you think about? 
testosterone, right? Testosterone, you know, DHT, all those other uh, different, you know, androgen, androgenic steroids. Um, any of those could potentially cause things like liver cancer, right? Because again, they tend, you know, androgenic steroids tend to be pretty tough on the liver and cause mutations, cause liver damage, right? Uh, things like alkylating agents. We'll talk about these later, later on, but this is a lot of our early anti-cancer drugs we have, and we still use to this day because they're very effective at killing cancer cells, but they can lead to things like leukemia as a secondary effect from treating. So you may start out with something like a bone cancer, and now suddenly you have leukemia you're dealing with, right? Um, some other drugs here, we have things like, you know, um, you know, say certain estrogens can lead to certain cancers, uh, especially, you know, you think about estrogens, what does that do to the endometrium? Stimulates growth, right? So if you had unchecked estrogen effect there, guess what? You can see endometrial cancer, right? So again, anything stimulating the cells to replicate and grow eventually leads to errors, right? Those errors, known as mutations, lead to that uh, where these cancer cells can develop, right? And sometimes it only takes one cell with that mutation to actually kick off and begin the whole cancerous process there, right? So anyway, so again, just some ideas. Notice a lot of these tend to be, um, uh, and you'll cover, you'll, you'll look back at this later once we cover all these drugs, and you'll be like, yeah, most of these are anti-cancer drugs, are the reason here. So again, we know that's a double-edged sword. We know that's what we're, uh, it's a potential concern. But again, if you don't treat that initial cancer, you may not have a patient to give them a secondary cancer, right? So you got to do something with them, right? Anyway, so looking at, uh, again, just looking at some of the, the different functional capabilities of these cancer cells, what kind of gives them the, the leg up on everything else to kind of continue replicating and whatnot. You know, so for instance, you know, they evade growth suppressors who so could be certain substances that are naturally produced or to, you know, prevent cell growth. They can get around this some way, right? So uh, they can do things like, you know, um, uh, enabling this replicative immortality. So uh, there's certain uh, substances called uh, telomerases. Uh, they're going to be on the DNA. They kind of, once they, they kind of shorten as time goes on, um, and then once they get to down to a certain point, then they can't really replicate any further on the DNA. Well, guess what? They have this immortalization that occurs. They can continue growing because their uh, telomerases don't ever get cut down to size. Um, things like inducing angiogenesis. Why do you think this may help cancer cells? Angiogenesis is just what? Yeah, pretty, yeah, getting uh, new blood vessels. They get more blood supply. And guess what that brings? Nutrients, right? So if the cancer cells run out of nutrients, they can't continue to grow. So they can stimulate angiogenesis. Now all of a sudden they have new supplies, they can now start to grow again. Okay. Um, things like resisting cell death. We mentioned that um, you know, loss of P53 gene, you know, can lead to that. I find it really interesting though. This book I pulled this from, this is a pretty standard like um, pharmacy book. Um, they, they put a cross here as resisting cell death. And I was like, wow, that's an interesting link there. But that's just me. <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, again, this is, you know, Satan's day on Halloween. So there you go. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, right. So again, looking at our, our, our tumor cells. So again, we have a couple of different things we'll talk about here. One being hyperplasia, which is, what is that? Increased size, number of cells here, right? And again, you can have this occur naturally. Right? So when you have hyperplasia occur, that can be a protective function. It can be a normal function, part of homeostasis that occurs. Typically, this is reversible, right? So whatever exposure that was occurring to cause this to happen, uh, once it goes away, you'll kind of revert back to normal, right? So again, no function and change, uh, change in function has occurred for these cells. They still work just like they normally did. So, um, when you have these tumor cells, though, when you have uh, what we call metaplasias, where you have usually um, some sort of uh, one type of cell is going to kind of sub in for another one that can happen here. So this can be things like with chronic irritation. So if you think about like your calloused fingers and things like that, if you chronically irritate the, the finger, uh, the skin on the fingers, eventually you develop calluses. It's a, a sort of metaplasia you see with that. And again, typically a protective response and typically uh, can be reversible uh, for the most part. You may see some loss of function, but again, it could be a protective function there. Moving on, you have things like dysplasia, right? So this is where we're getting more towards the cancer side of things. We're starting to see this loss of uniformity. You lose some kind of that architectural sort of orientation there. Um, but again, may still be early enough where it could be reversible, okay? So again, not quite a cancerous, yes, but it could be a dysplasia, which um, can be reversible if you were to limit further exposure to whatever is causing that to occur. Where it gets bad is where you have this new neoplasia, right? So this is where you have the uncoordinated growth. This is where you have the cells starting to kind of grow despite, um, you know, maybe some growth suppressor uh, sort of substances may be exposed to, it may stop developing its own, and you lose that P53 gene, all these sort of things. And again, I mentioned that immortalization of that telomerase, right? So basically the, the DNA never gets kind of chopped down over time, so they can continue growing uh, sort of uh, ad infinitum, right? And again, at this point, this tends to be irreversible, okay? So again, once it has that immortalization occur there, it's going to continue to grow kind of unchecked until it runs out of of, um, uh, nutrients or it kills off the host and runs out of nutrients that way, right? So, and again, um, you know, we're talking about, you know, say a more benign sort of tumor, you think about things, you know, they're localized, they're pretty enclosed in a fibrous capsule, you know, it's pretty easy to remove, right? I can just go into the, you know, surgeon, go in, take it right out, no problem. Easy survival of the patient. When you get more malignant is where it's going to start to spread out, sort of kind of kill off other kind of healthy uh, tissue there. It tends to metastasize, which just means what? 
it's going to spread around, right? So it's going to have this hematogenous spread where then all of a sudden you can have, um, you know, say, uh, breast cancer, then start developing the thyroid or elsewhere, right? Um, and typically it will lead eventually to the death of the patient unless you treat it early on. Again, you can grade it based off of the type of cells that are there, how differentiated they are, how, um, you know, uh, you know, if they've been metastasized, all these sorts of things there. Uh, again, I'm not going to get deep into the actual grading of it, but it's something you'll cover when you uh, hit some of these individual cancers here. Um, things I want to focus on, though, is how are we actually going to target these cells? How are we actually going to try to uh, affect cancer cells while avoiding healthy cells? Okay. And so, again, we are dealing with antibiotics. Why do we like antibiotics? Well, because they're very specific for the targeting the bacteria, right? Does that mean there are no side effects associated with it? No, there are certainly side effects, but again, it's typically more um, uh, selective against the bacterial cells to kind of avoid our cells. With uh, a lot of these older school sort of cancer drugs, you're going to find that they don't really differentiate between the two. So the idea is, is try to get rid of as many cancer cells as possible, knowing that you're going to be killing off healthy cells as well, and then try to uh, recover the patient, give them enough time to recover those normal healthy cells so that we can give another round of, of chemotherapy later, right? And again, there's other uh, routes. We'll talk about things like surgery, radiation, but again, I'm mainly going to focus on the chemotherapy because that's, we're in a pharmacology class, right? Um, so when you're looking at these cells, again, a single clonogenic or tumor cell, right, that has this mutation, um, can lead to that unlimited replication. So this is why you see a lot of recurrence of cancers. Um, you have to kill every single tumor stem cell. If you don't, they're just going to continue growing back later on. Now, how easy do you think it is to get rid of every single cancer cell? exceedingly difficult, right? So again, that's why you have a lot of these recurrences here. And again, what's the main marker for, uh, you know, say success of a chemotherapy treatment, do you think? You know, things like five-year survival, right? So just even five years is pretty good, right? So you look at things like that when you're kind of comparing different cancer treatment regimens. Um, but again, we know that you have to get all those cells. We'll look at some different means to, to do that. But again, one of the things we're going to note here is that different tumors have a lot of different growth patterns, right? So prostate cancer is going to grow a lot different than, say, something like lung cancer. And so based on that, we can also see that changes in the stage of disease will play a role here. Um, you know, whether we're dealing with a well-differentiated versus a non-differentiated sort of cell, right? If we're dealing with a fast or slow-growing sort of cell here, right? Um, you know, leukemias, they grow super fast, right? We're always producing new white blood cells. So again, those can be very rapid growing versus something like the colon or the prostate. You know, how localized or disseminated the growth is, right? So if it's very disseminated, it makes it much harder to treat. We need to use more systemic measures versus if it's very localized, we can do things like surgery. We can do things like radiation, right? Um, and then also looking at the heterogeneity of the tumor. What do you think that means? You have different types of cells that are kind of getting involved here, right? So heterogeneity just means how different all the cells are together, right? Um, so again, if you have multiple cells with different characteristics, again, that can make it more difficult as well to treat. So... Um, one of the big factors here we're going to look at is called this Gompertzian cell growth. Has anyone ever heard of this before? Okay, I don't know who Dr. Gompertz was, but I'm sure he was a very famous uh, oncologist, maybe. Um, but basically, it says that each tumor takes a constant time to double its size. Okay, so again, based on the the type of cancer you're dealing with, the type of cells, again, it takes about the same time for them to double its size. And so, what you're going to find is as the tumor size increases, the growth fraction or the fraction of cells that are actively replicating tends to decrease. Why do you think that is? usually due to supply and demand, right? So they're demanding a lot of supplies. And if you have uh, such a large tumor, you can't deliver enough supplies to them to continue growing, they're gonna stop growing, right? So again, this is where we're gonna find um, that typically you're gonna find this plateauing effect that occurs here because that growth fraction goes down over time. So initially it's very rapid growth and then it tends to flatten out, right? And then mainly it's due to just outgrowing that, that supply. So if you were to look at this, if you were to look at the actual cell growth here, and again, you're looking at 10 to the you know, powers here uh, of growth, you know, it can be a while. You can be developing this kind of subclinical disease for a while until you actually get the full diagnosis before actual symptoms actually can occur here and before actual patient death occurs, okay? And so um, one of the things you're going to look at is actually the fraction of cell kill that you're going to have um, when you're when you're treating these sorts of things here, right? So you're looking at, um, you know, different modalities are going to be able to get um, different kind of rates of cell kill, okay? Because we know, are we going to get every single cell out there? Probably not, right? It's very unlikely to do that. But, you know, we'll see things like, you know, 99.9% .9 kill. That sounds pretty good, but if you're already dealing with like a billion cells, that's still a lot of cells left afterwards uh, that can continue to grow. So we're going to look at this and see kind of different modalities how it's going to play a role here. So again, just to give you an idea of the size of a tumor here, you know, to get 10 to the 12th cells before you even get to a, a kilogram here. So again, the, the, the fraction is going to grow very quickly and then eventually it's going to kind of flatten back out. Again, not all of them are going to be a solid tumor like that. Some are going to be more diffuse, especially with like leukemias. We deal with a ton of leukemias over in pediatrics. Again, that's where I get most of my experience from. Um, again, I'm not a trained oncology pharmacist. So again, I'm giving you kind of what I know. 
Um, but just know that you may, if you talk to other people who do this all the time, they may have a different opinion on certain things. But um, looking at this, we're going to find that the, the treatment, typically, if we can, try to remove the tumor first. It's always going to be our first step there. So this is where things like surgery is going to be very uh, well uh, suited to do this. This is really good for well-localized, well-differentiated tumors, right? Um, radiation therapy can be good if it's, a, say, a localized tumor, but maybe not easily removed, right? So you're thinking like a brain tumor or something like that. This is where our radiation uh, can play a role here. And then finally, ke uh, chemotherapy tends to be the most systemic um, uh, out of the bunch here, right? Um, again, because I could irradiate the entire person, but guess what? It's going to lead to a lot of cell damage, it's going to lead to a lot of side effects, maybe new cancers. Um, however, chemotherapy can be administered systemically, usually IV, and you can actually get um, a lot of these uh, metastatic cells that are kind of escaped, maybe the original area wherever the, the cancer was initially, okay? And it's also going to target a lot of these rapidly dividing cells. And so looking at this, you can see the different modalities here. So imagine you were to have a patient who got surgery. So you say you go ahead and um, say you get this diagnosis here. You knock them down, say to this amount, and you still need to kill off these different cells. So what do you think this is here? What do you think it kind of raises up and goes down, raises up and goes down? Those are basically going to be different cycles of treatment, right? So again, you're going to find this is where patients have uh, multiple cycles of treatment with things like chemotherapy or radiation because you have to basically, um, you know, say knock the cells down. You have to give the patient time to recover, but guess what's also recovering? The cancer cells are also recovering as well, right? And then, because it's hard to differentiate between those two, and then you give them another round of chemotherapy or radiation, right? You knock them down, give the patient time to recover, right? Given, and so this is why I always hate chemotherapy because, again, I'm a toxicologist. What do I like? I like antidotes. I like curing people. I don't like to give them poison, but this is a case where I actually have to give them poison to get, get rid of those bad cells. So, again, not my favorite stuff to do, but... We do it anyway. Um, so again, you'll find that oftentimes they're going to get multiple rounds uh, of a therapy in order to make sure you try to get as many of those cells as possible. You let the patient recover and then hit them again. Okay. Again, the idea is eventually you get down to zero cells. But again, if you actually get that or not, you have to give it time. You have to find out, you know, over that five-year period or so, to see did it have a relapse, have a recurrence of disease. So. Um, and typically what we're going to find is when we're treating these patients is that the drug concentration, the exposure time, how frequently we can administer the drugs uh, is very critical for the effectiveness, right? Because I can give them enough drug to kill off every single one of those cancer cells. What else am I going to kill off? The person, right? So again, I don't want to do that. I'd like to keep them alive while getting the cancer cells. So we have to see where, um, you know, things like, you know, maximizing the benefit of getting rid of those cells versus risking uh, the, the ratio of, of risk that I have that I'm actually giving to the patient. So this is where we see a lot of side effects from these drugs. Because again, the stuff we're giving them is poison. It's going to kill a lot of their healthy cells in addition to just their, their uh, cancer cells. And so again, you're going to see a lot of toxicities. One of the big ones would be myelosuppression, right? So again, oftentimes for these patients, uh, it's not the cancer that kills them. It's oftentimes the secondary infections they get because we wiped out their whole immune system right so these are things you have to consider okay what are the secondary things i need to worry about because i've caused so much toxicity here you know so typically what we're going to find is that we'll do things like you know high dose intermittent schedules intermittent just means you're going to get it um say on day one you get it on day seven you're going to day on day 15 right so you're going to be intermittent and you get it, you know, once every few weeks, once every few months, something like that. That allows for the blood cells to, to reconstitute themselves, right? It gives it the time for the white blood cells, red blood cells to kind of start growing again. Um, and then the idea of when do we try to target these cells when they're most maximally susceptible to the drugs can be really important as well. Because you're going to find most of these are working on cells that are actively replicating, okay? So you're actively dividing cells are going to be the ones we're going to be hitting most. So we have to figure out what part of the cell cycle they're actually in. You know, where are they at within that growth curve? Okay, so imagine if we had a cell that was, um, if you had a tumor that was like just a huge, huge tumor, right? We mentioned that growth fraction goes down pretty significantly. I can give them chemotherapy, but a lot of those cells that aren't rapidly dividing, guess what? They don't get affected very much. Versus if I were to give them, say, uh, surgery, or if I were to give them radiation, or knock that cell growth down, what happens to that cell fraction of growth now? What well, goes down is going to get pretty rapid again, because again, say, hey, I got all the supply now, there's not very many cells, I'm going to start growing again. But that's when I can hit them with the chemotherapy, because now they're, uh, they're rapidly dividing, that's where all my drugs can get in there and actually work. And we're going to see how those are going to work in just a little bit later, uh, probably the next time we meet, uh, to, to see how these different drugs actually uh, you know, have, have their mechanism of action. But just remember, remember the cell cycle back from biology back in the day? Like, that's going to come up again, so it's important to remember things like the S phase, G1, G2, all that good stuff, right? So I will leave it at that. Any questions? <coughs> Hold on, I'll leave you. Let me check the board.